Star Trek The Next Generation was a show. Star Trek The Next Generation everybody was I interacted a show with. that I started watching when I was a really little kid. Can this you believe it's been it 30 years since Star Trek The Next Generation first Star Trek The Next Generation was my life as a kid. It was the escape from reality. Welcome to Next Generation's First Generation, where Patrick Delmore and Sasha Shouties take a look back into their favorite childhood show, Star Trek The Next Generation. This is where we attempt to reconcile how we felt as children watching the show and looking back as old farts now in our late 30s, almost 40s. Yep, 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 uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Orson Welles used to do commercials for It's Fermented Bottle. <laughs> it's Fermented in the Bottle? Yeah. What was that for? No, it's the, the old Paul Marsan commercial, the wine you have here. Oh. But I think for the, before we start, we should all take five minutes and talk about how much we like Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat that, please? I think you heard me. Lloyd Brom. Braun from Seinfeld. <laughs> the character he played on Seinfeld a couple years. He was only 31 years old when he filmed this part. What, what, what? Yeah. Oh my gosh. He's actually a lot older than I thought he would be. We yeah, are we are old, and this episode is called what now? Uh, the Price. Hello, and welcome to the eighth episode of season three of Star Trek The Next Generation, which we are covering here on Next Generation's First Generation. I am one of your co-hosts, Patrick Delmore. I am also one of the co-hosts, Sasha Shouties. And we have two of our regulars back. To my direct left, we have David. Hi. And next to David, it's Matt. Hi, on Patrick's actual right. Well, if you make three lefts, that's all right. So I just did the introductions around the other way of the microphone. Yeah. So this is what, the eighth, eighth episode of season three? Holy smokes, we're just chugging through these. We are. Wow, so this is a really fun episode because this is one of the first times where we see Ferengi becoming more the modern Ferengi, yep. as you can say. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of contradictions within this episode, which we'll get to as we go along, but I am excited because I watched these beforehand on Netflix, which has the HD version, and this is a very special effects heavy episode with wormholes and shuttlecrafts, what have you, and now we are about to watch it on an old DVD. So we will see uh, how it looked when it originally aired in 1989. So if your player of choice is ready, we're going to give you the countdown of 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and we will hit enter. That was the preamble to the countdown. Here's the actual one. 5, Five 4, four three, 3, 2, two and 1. one. <laughs> players waking up. You know, that countdown kind of reminded me of salsa dancing. Yeah. Where it's actually one, two, three, four, five, six. Cha, oh, cha, cha. But isn't that rest an extra beat? And they tell me don't think. Yeah. Okay, so here's Manitoba. Troy. Yeah. She's, oh, three letters from her mom. Which is ironic because the computer voice is her mom. Mm. Maybe that's why Deanna looks so pained all the time. Not only was she an, a- an ambassador, she was a voice actor for the Federation. Now she's... This, I think this is the origin of the Deanna Troy's love for chocolate, which uh, Marina Sirtis, when she would eat chocolate on the show, had to spit it out into a bucket next to her after she took every bite. Oh, I bet. Because okay. imagine doing ten takes with ice cream. Yeah. That's hard to do. Well, that's also why I like a lot of crime... A real crime TV shows, the investigator has the empty cup of coffee. Yeah. Oh, wow. Did you see that? Uh, Troy was about to get real with the computer. Yeah. yeah. To define what real is. Yeah. He was like, I think you're a little too into chocolate. So Picard wants to call Deanna down to the 10 Ford. I guess there's some kind of uh, diplomatic function happening. Oh, they're going to look at a war- at a, uh, the, at a uh, wormhole. Yeah. Would you like to come down and see my wormhole? Yeah. <laughs> no. No, maybe not. Those beautiful oak doors. She walks into 10 Ford. There they establish the... the 
friendliness between John Franks there or Riker. Yeah, I like how their 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 relationship is presented in this episode a lot more than I have in previous episodes. It was very warm. Please take my arm. Yeah. Welcome. They're doing an introduction to the diplomat. Oh, this guy. It's it's Bashir's dad. No, no it's it isn't. Oh, it so looks like him though. He is a very fa- he is a famous character actor. Uh, Scott and Chris went through who all these people are on um, Star Trek Monthly Mondays back five years ago when they covered this episode. There's Lloyd Braun from Seinfeld. Yeah. Um, Bashir's dad was uh, Babu Bhatt from Seinfeld. Yeah, who is who is a an Indian guy. This guy is uh, Hispanic. Yeah. Mendoza. Oh. I think it was just the mustache. It was just like, that mustache. This guy's looking very, very 1950s chic here with the, with the yeah. grease kind hair. Of no, well, yeah, Norman Batesy, yeah. You can That's see, the idea. He's the slick salesman. You, you could see him in, like, a leather jacket on the back of a Triumph. No? What they don't show on camera is that he's trying to get Data to buy a very used but practically new shuttlecraft. <laughs> Isn't it weird that um, they kind of music, introduced him with a music sting? Yeah. Like, this is important. Um, now, what's weird here is that we've already had Picard say that, you know, money is not an issue anymore in the Federation, but they'll have trade negotiations where money is exchanged on their ship. Well, no, we, they never actually said money was being exchanged for this deal. You remember the times they talk about stuff, they talk about trade commodities, not it, we're going resources. to give you cash. So it's kind of like... The, except the Ferengi. The Ferengi, well, the Ferengi throw that bribe down and we'll give you whatever you deal plus the gold on top. Is, is the line he'll use. But the Federation talks about stuff as how we're willing to provide our deal will consist of logistical support, maybe a military aid package, you know, where we'd send you torpedoes and, you know, other, like, and I think they'll, like, they'll mention some kind of mineral deposits and stuff. So this is, this episode came out November 13th, 1989, so you are getting ready for Turkey Day, people. That means you're slimming down for that horrible, horrible mandatory feast with friends and family. Yeah, in real time, we're back in October, and we're certainly hoping come November that there's something to be thankful for. I'm getting, I'm getting ready for Halloween. Yeah. Well, Halloween have, has passed. It has come and gone since you've heard this. This episode, uh, our good friend Ron Jones does the music. It was done, uh, The episode was written by Hannah Louise Shearer and directed by Robert Shearer. Well, hey, is that a husband-wife? No, it's a different spelling. Huh. Okay. Too bad they didn't get Harry Shearer to start it. So, <laughs> as, anyway, this is going to be a really fun episode. Uh, we were kind of talking before the record on how we see a lot of new things in here. I think they really set up Troy and Riker's relationship. Pretty much sets the tone for the rest of the show, in my opinion. It makes me wonder, like, none of the... None of the main Simpsons people have ever had big, have ever done Star Trek guest roles, have they? Hmm. Um, hmm. The biggest Simpsons Star Trek connection is that uh, George Takei was frequently a voice on The Simpsons in the early years. That is correct. So here they're laying down the framework. There's a stable wormhole. The Bar- Barzan wormhole is what they call it. Yeah. yeah. And so they want, this species wants to sell the wormhole or rights to its access. And I believe the Delta Quadrant, ring a bell. And uh, so the, the the problem is, though, the Barzan, they, they're they not very good at negotiating. So they're, they're calling in a third party uh, negotiator to, to basically solicit... No, the, 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 the Barzan called in the Federation. The, the, to host it. Yeah. Oh, to host it. Yeah, oh, that, that yeah. guy, the other guy there, is representing a third bidder. Yeah. Is he? Now? Yeah, he's not facilitating. Picard is facilitating. And he played uh, the Predator in uh, the Predator, the first two Predator movies. No. Yes. Wow. He died not too long after this was done. <clears throat> Calling up Chief O'Brien. And they are really giving short shrift to the Ferengi here for no reason at all. Because, mm-hmm. like, this is their... It's, it's a very racist response, in my opinion. Yeah. Or xenophobic, I think is probably a better way to put it. 
you know, the Ferengi, Ferengi are uh, angry that they're being left out. My name is Damon Zahn. And these are my counsels, Cole and Master Aragorn. And Damon Matt. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first time, too, we also see a doctor in the Ferengi. That's kind of nice. Yeah. But, you know, I can see why, but it's on the other side of it. <laughs> One, who's to say they have to include the Ferengi? When the United States, when there's a bidding thing, mm -hmm. the United States is involved. Not every country in the world is automatically included or invited. That's true, but these guys are and, all about commerce. But if you think about it, the Ferengi do probably back then have the reputation for stealing, cheating, and giving substandard deals. So it's one of those, do we really want to deal with these people for something of this level? Did we ever get into what happens if a Ferengi is caught stealing something? I don't think they do steal. No, they, they, steal. they manipulate. No, they, they flat out nog in the first episode of Deep Space Nine is stealing something. But that's representative, I think, more of the character than the species. Because a Ferengi, a Ferengi would mu much rather fleece you in a deal than straight Right, but if rotting. they have the opportunity, I think they'll steal. Mm. They were doing the Ferengi in Enterprise. I guess you could say they were ancient Ferengi, but they pirate shipped... The Enterprise, remember? So, yes, that is true. They do that here where they steal the Enterprise D. So here's with what the birds of prey. So I'm going to change the topic. Here's what Deanna is doing. The modern day equivalent is stalking somebody's Facebook on yeah. your crush. <laughs> reading his reading his profile. Delete browser history. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't come too close. I don't want you to see what's on the monitor. Well, she's reading public right. She's reading his public record too. Yeah, which, this which, is anybody, which any of the command staff on the ship could look at. And probably would have gotten. But how would you up. feel if you walked into a lady's office and there was your profile right there? On She's the thinking about it and we're talking about it. Hey, hey. But think of it this way. So if you got somebody new coming on, you, you would pull up a patient record, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the same. She's it's Again, you, you think of this as like... Her being a civilian person in an office building. She's a Starfleet officer in a military organization. All of the senior staff would have been briefed on all information on everybody. And then Worf probably would have put together a quick briefing on the Ferengi of what they knew of those three Ferengi and distributed it. Well, here this guy isn't wasting any time. He's already asked you to dinner in the, the 30 seconds that the scene has started. Well, it's a 45 minute episode. He is in... He is in now his personal bubble, and she's looking very uncomfortable. Look at that. Not she always she contact. always does, though. And this is another one where her dialogue is going to betray her. This isn't quite like where... Uh, Whoa, look at that. Unwanted touching. Putting his hand but Yeah, her she's hair. playing it very differently than how she's speaking about it later on when she and <clears throat> Crusher talk about this. Because she says... That she's into it, but it's like, you know, just the, just the read you get off of her, she does not like this. I think that's part of the, the, the act, is that her body says no, but her mind said, says yes, or, or maybe it's one of those. I don't, that, that's, a, that's a precedent I don't care for. No, I don't either, but I'm just talking about period-specific. This is maybe what they're trying to do for television. It's you know they're they're kind of pulling from misogynistic lines, obviously. Mm -hmm. Oh, give well, that, that yeah, that's painfully obvious because it's the women all wear the tight jumpsuits all yeah. the way through the entire run of all three Star Trek series, versus the guys who wear the you know normal I guess to say fitted uniforms. So this is this is kind of where where I have to say I'm not. I'm not too happy with some of the writing in the show because this episode is very much the will turn Deanna into a subservient woman who only focuses on one person. It, oh, I don't think so. I no? think that, you know, yeah, this is a typical this is, Deanna this is, Troy. This is well, this is actually a lot better than most <laughs> Troy episodes because she solves a problem for the crew that doesn't involve her. Um, <clears throat> You see her arrogance, and they'll talk. We'll get into that later. But she's actually she takes a she gets put in her place directly the way she needs to by by one of the guys here. Yeah. You think? Oh yeah, okay. and you'll see it. I'll point it out when it comes out. But 
So what they're in now is they're they're the, all the decision makers are in Picard's office. They're trying to figure out how to scientifically chalk up this wormhole. Yeah. Uh, they they came up with the option of uh, sending a probe or maybe even a shuttlecraft through this wormhole, which doesn't look so great. No, they're um, the people that um, the people that discovered it only had limited probe technologies. <coughs> That's another interesting thing. Is he, I think Data just said they don't have manned space travel, which is strange that the Federation will be dealing with. Well, them. so no, it's they've probably reached it. It's probably they just don't do it. Ah, might be too cost prohibitive. I mean, we have manned space travel, but we just don't do it very often. We've done it. We just stopped. Yeah. So here we are. The doctor is did a, a shot there on the daemon. That's a little strange. So actually, I think they brought those two actors back for the for the uh, other episode. For, for Voyager, Voyager, yeah, no, they brought the same actor, the same actors. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, when they t- when they go into the negotiations, they talk about how they they have no natural resources for the you know like modern mm-hmm. stuff on their planet. That's why they're negotiating this. So they may not have like dilithium access to do warp powered ships and and things and. So they've Speaking got the, of the nervous prom date, yeah. the romantic Ronjo's mm-hmm. music. See, I I can never get a read on on Deanna in this uh, episode. In this episode, also flashbacks to the other one where she finds a negotiator, and he uses her for a telepathic dump, and she ages through the episode. Do you do you remember that? Yeah, season yeah. seven. Yeah, it it almost hints to that. That's kind of all they could do with. With Troy, unfortunately, to be the telepathic dump. But no, I think this is actually one of her better episodes. Um, just off the top of my head, this uh, disaster, the uh, the one where her mom's going through issues. Mm-hmm. I like the one where um, she becomes a command officer. That's the one where Data yeah. gets trapped on that. Planet. Yeah, that is a very really good one where she's got to actually figure out yep. what it takes. In my mind, it's like the first time you see her as a Starfleet officer. Well, yeah, and she goes through her command training where she has to order someone to die, and that's, yeah. that's the thing that she uh-huh. didn't think she could do. Well, on the flip side, you know, Deanna, I think she's just trying to date. If we were in this situation... I think it's poor writing that they wrote her character that way. Because I always go back to this is a military ship. There's no way Picard would be okay with her just jumping into bed with anybody they... they well, especially no, when you're directly I doing Let's reframe stuff that. Let's reframe that. Because a lot of times we'll see characters have relationships with the guest of the day. So like Wesley and the Molassomorph. I don't think that would have been appropriate either. Or Riker. Every time somebody comes to him winking and nodding, I mean, it's just. But then we wouldn't have a show. Yeah, sex <laughs> is much more casual and involves less less emotions. It's um, it's like you're you're coming into port. You have, you know, somebody new that you can mm-hmm. can hook up with. Coming into port, yes, I understand that. Hooking up with one of the people that your government is negotiating with, I mean, it's just you know. I mean, be like, it'd be one thing if this, if she just met him at a starbase and he wasn't I mean, directly involved right. with something they were doing. The only time you ever see somebody get punished for that is, is uh, Harry Kim in that episode where he gets the STD. That's right, where he glows or something. Yeah, yeah, and I thought that was appropriate. I'm like, yeah, and he's like, no big deal. Like, yeah, it kind of is. You brought a you brought a disease back from the from the. You, you got your own little souvenir there. <clears throat> That's really funny. So what we uh, missed here was Dr. Mendoza, the uh, negotiator for the Federation, has been found ill, stumbling into the sick bay, and now they are talking to the Ferengi saying, hey, uh, maybe you poisoned him. And we know they did, because we saw them. They plotted him, yep. So that shot he was getting was the antidote for uh, for the poison that he put on the palm of his hand. So... Captain Card of the USS Enterprise. Oh, so he actually didn't know that this had happened in the middle of the yet. That's right. Our mistake. Oh, yeah. That's what happens when we talk over the dialogue, silly us. 
He certainly can't go back to negotiations with her. So now they have to figure out how. I think R- Riker, he steps in as yep. a negotiator. That's right. But I can't, Captain. I don't believe in the negotiations. <laughs> yeah. Is that measure of a man? Right? Yeah. Yeah, he's always the guy who has to step in for... <clears throat> I'm surprised Picard doesn't negotiate. Well, he's about to explain why he can't negotiate. He's the host. Oh, gotcha. They should have Guinan negotiate. She could probably do it. She would shoot. She, unlike Guinan, would reveal too much about the people that are there. Yeah. She, so, I mean, she just cut through all the red tape and go, well, anyway, it's going to turn out that wormhole doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't work. And, you know, and <laughs> this guy's doing this, and this guy's obviously this. And then, yeah, the episode would be over in five minutes. Now, if you'll excuse me. My species actually hibernates after this such and such hour. <laughs> you mean you're going to bed? No, I'm hibernating. Don't call me. So this is very much would have been a neat spinoff show where like uh, Jordy and Data stranded in the in the Delta Quadrant. I think that would have been a much funnier Punch and Judy short where it's just that frame up frame up of the shuttle crap, and then you just have like Punch and Judy puppets or like or Muppets of the two of them. Ah. Uh, yeah. Just sitting there. I can see that. See, look at that. Steven Data says, well, you'll have me to talk to. Yeah. So, uh, you said this was an effect-heavy episode, Patrick. What are you noticing? It looks very much the same in HD as it does in um, SD. It's just the uh, the shifts are rendered a little bit better. I'm like, oh, that's, that, that looks bad. The travel through the wormhole, but... You forget when Deep Space Nine starts, you almost never see a Ferengi ship on Deep Space Nine. But you did see them all the time on this. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've said it before, but the first time I consciously remember seeing a Ferengi ship was in a Micro Machine set of uh, yeah, Star Trek ships. That. And I was like, what is this one? And it's a Ferengi they show ship. the shuttle several times yeah. in Deep Space Nine, but never any of the Marauder class, yeah. the big ones. Yeah, you think that the, the Grand Nagus would fly around in something better than a ship? I think that he would, yeah, have a ship that looks kind of like the Emperor's ship in um, Discovery. Yeah. Where it's got like a Unless palace. Unless it costs too much. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, the other side is you can be so cheap that I'm not paying money for that. Right. <laughs> Next thing you know, the Nagus is really your cheap Uncle Joe. <laughs> it's platinum, le- you know, laced, not plat- solid platinum. So so here we are at the negotiating table. The, the two shuttles have gone in. They're going to figure stuff out. While they're gone, they're going to banter and position... For the for the wormhole in this conference room, and uh, like a bad the, James Garner the, film. Yeah, the argument here is that uh, you know the Federation just has way too much prestige and arrogance. Uh, I represent a, a smaller interested party that is going to be responsible with the access. Nobody to wanted to see this. this. Oh, the the foot massage. Yeah. <laughs> Not one person was like, "Oh man." I want to see Lloyd Braun grease up uh, the Antitroid's foot. That's <laughs> uh, good uh, toenail polish there. I'm sure. I'm sure the that same, doesn't help. Yeah. The same guy that put Wesley Crusher in a pumpkin sweater probably painted her toe. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at these piggies. We got to oil you up and put you on screen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, she looks happy. Yeah. You know, in this whole episode, this guy, I didn't catch his name, Lloyd Braun. What, what's the character? Devanani Raw. Huh? Devanani Raw. Devanani? You know, he did nothing wrong in this episode. No, he didn't. Yes, he, well, he does at the very end. Does what does he do wrong at the very end? Where he said does the fake thing where the Ferengi was going to attack the ship and it was all at his... Uh... That's not wrong in the negotiation. Huh. Well, anyway, the, the thing is, is like... There's a slow build in this episode to say, hey, he's the outsider, and we shouldn't really trust him. But no, I agree that how he how he markets things by, you know, just picking up stuff about people. I mean, that's basically how viral marketing works now. <laughs> he did it to them. He'll do it to demonstrate that the Federation is, 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 is you know, it is, is gets into a lot of armed conflicts. Yeah. It's, it's not, I mean... If he violated a law or something, Picard would have ordered Worf to take him into custody. 
So I'm kind of curious here. I'm, I'm changing subjects a little. How all the actors and the producers felt about a sex scene on primetime TV. This isn't really a sex scene, but it, it implies. Yeah, you know, no there, more than any, and there were a lot more implications in other shows than there was, and this just implies that there. It's like he doesn't have a shirt on; she's sitting on top of him. That's not. She's fully clothed. Yeah, yeah. and they and they're but they're oiling each other. I mean. A with massage, the, mm-hmm. with the exception, with the exception, and it was a of, foot, not a, not like she was like bareback and getting massaged. True, but with the exception of uh, Data and Yar, uh, you know, we haven't really seen much sex on this show. Well, and uh, Riker and the head of that uh, all-female planet. Oh yes, I forgot about that, but that was insinuating. And then yeah, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, were they? Yeah. Okay. And then you had. Um, I can't remember. Oh, and then that horrible all naked running people episode. Oh, uh, do you yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. So, at what time of day did this did TNG typically air? Oh, but came Prime on time. here in Washington. It came on at seven p.m. on a Saturday. Or maybe not even that. Maybe it was six. No, it was like six p.m. on a Saturday. On a that, Saturday? Yeah, it was yeah, on when, Saturday night. When uh, for me, uh, growing up in Columbus, this always came out on Wednesdays. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it was a syndicated show, so it was a different. The entire time it was on, it was in syndication, so it could air in different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was different days. Yeah, we had it. Um, the original series would play at five, and then Next Gen would play at six, and then when Deep Space Nine started, I think they. I don't know. They kept showing the original series. So it'd be the original series, then Next Gen, then Deep Space Nine at 7. What channel? On uh, Q13 Fox. Remember when UPN came out? Yes. And they would just have... I'm trying to forget that for years. Yep. And Voyager was one of their, was like with their flagship show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That and... This is a long wormhole. Yeah. Holy cow, they've been flying in that thing forever. That and the, uh, the Diary of Desmond Pfeiffer, which is like a... Um, American Black Adder. Mm-hmm. So there they are on the other side of the galaxy. And they only make one trip. Yeah. I'm, I always was surprised how much these guys did not want to be bothered. Don't talk to us. Don't engage with us. We're, we're just fine. Leave us alone. We are not where we are supposed to be. You mean we're on the other side of the world? Yeah, but the wormhole is in the wrong, is the wrong part of the Delta universe. Part. Yeah. I think they never had, before they hadn't clearly defined what quadrants are. This is the first time, like, so I can't. That's still a problem, because you can't define the universe in quadrants. Yeah. Well, the galaxy is supposed to be yeah. just one-fourth. But you can't. It's The galaxy is endless. You, you know, out there, you, there's no physical boundary. You can't say it's a square and here's one fourth and one fourth. There's well, that's no why. Defined... That's why this show, Star Trek, the world of Star Trek is two dimensional. It's yeah, not very much up and down, other than maybe. They need a... to have Jason Voorhees chasing them to get them to get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> ah, there you go. Oh, this episode. Yeah. This was the no. This was the oh. scene that everybody would wanted to watch, not the no the No, no. To me, this is like this is what your great aunt does when you're not there. I, I, I just, I don't understand the purpose of the scene, like... There's an exact so, purpose. They wanted to put the two female crew members in skin-tight leotards and have them stretch and... It, it didn't work. And I, I, love, mean, I love how those, uh, those outfits deliberately call attention to their boobs. They must have felt yeah. just well, that, incredible yeah. doing well, this. No, it's, they, what that just said, they, the intention was, to, was just to make every teenage boy suddenly sit up in his chair. I mean, it didn't work. Yeah. But it was because it is just one of those nasty things. Well, but it's it's when, fairly obvious what they were trying to do. I was almost that teenage boy when this came out. I was nine, so maybe a couple of years older. And the first thing I thought is, "Ew!" I know it's, old ladies exercising. Yeah. It's hey, it's my clothing. mom, <laughs> right? Exercising <laughs> right. downstairs with after dad goes yeah. to work. Because, because yeah, my mom she was in her late thirties when this came out, so I'm just like, oh, jeez. Yeah, and that's why they never do this again. The next thing you see them working out is when they're doing stuff like with Worf, and they are they're all wearing you know like kimono robes, which mm-hmm. makes sense. But yeah, it's just 
it's obvious what they were trying to do. They just did not. They chose the wrong people and the wrong way to do it. Well, Maria Marina did say that she was threatened several times about her body image That's on the show, terrible. and that uh, at the same time she was. It was a mix of you're too thin, you're too fat, your your uh, your your hair is not the style in which that we want it. And so she keeps on going through all these changes because they keep on messing with the character. It's because they had such a huge writer turnover. They had no set. This is what it is. Every new executive producer, or not executive producer, you know, head writer would be like, nah, we're going to see Deanna like this instead. So this guy's pretty smart. He's trying to pick off the solicitors one at a time. That's why he's talking to this gentleman here in 10 Ford. Yeah, you detect weakness and you play into it. And, and you want to talk him out of the deal so he's one less person to worry about. That's how he got Mayor Dinkus elected in New York. <laughs> You'd be a really good voice actor. Who the guy that does Lloyd Braun? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so there it is. He's backing out. It's been very made clear that the maintenance and administrative requirements are beyond our abilities. The Federation would like to negotiate a trade agreement in which we could acquire the planet's rich deposits of Trillium 323. See? That's what they're, they're bartering goods and services. What can the Federation provide that they can? Mm -hmm. He's like, we can't provide you the administrative and technical needs you need. And we don't really want to. You know, and that's in addition to these, you know, rare ores and stuff that they have. So the Federation's like, well, we can administer the hell out of it, but we're going to have to heavily arm it because we shoot people all the time. At least that's what Devin Ani Rawls' big thing is. is yeah, they can run it, but they're going to have to have a lot of guns to do it. Yeah. So I think that, you know, the, the joke is that Star Trek is big gay space communism. If you've ever heard that in the Facebook pages. Um <clears throat> When, when you look at the economic model, the idea is that personal wealth, pursuit of wealth, is not that important. But they still need to, you know, have those transactions between civilizations to keep things running. So I wouldn't say communism. I'd say socialism. Yeah. I... I it's not I, I do not take I do not take that title that I threw out there seriously. Like I was just kind of no. I, was, I was making a jab at the at the because uh, it really is a Facebook socialistic community. society. The government provides you pretty much is at no charge. Well, not at no charge, but the, everybody has health care in the Federation, education. You know, you and know. the expectation is that you live to your full potential. Yeah, and that you and provide can, for the greater good, and you contribute. Yeah, okay. so that that it really is space socialism. So here's good LeVar Burton acting here. He's getting frustrated that these guys are throwing their ways, lives away, being stuck on the other side of the galaxy. I like how he looks at it it's like weather. Oh, it's getting it. worse. Them lightning storms getting closer, Dana. We yeah. gotta get out of here. So the shuttle's moving back in. They're going 8-bit. Okay, now this is a really good moment. Okay. <laughs> they panicked. They left. Oh, there's the wormhole. Right where it was expected to be. And there it goes. <laughs> They're stuck. <laughs> we'll see them in a few years. Well, I hope a lost starship comes passing by this area and can take us home in six or seven years. Right. <laughs> They're back to... So this is what, about three dinners in now? I think this is the second. Yeah, the second dinner, but the third meeting that they yeah. had. If he's that, if, if he's that empathic, he wouldn't ever start anything. Was let me tell you something about Commander Riker. Yeah. So this is interesting. Here they're talking about Riker. This whole conversation, she gets kind of pissy, and he puts her in his pl her place pretty solidly. I think, right. and, it, and it says a lot of things that need to be said to her about her whole. I guess you could say arrogance of the way, you know, what's going on with her. Those are some pretty violent looking forks they have there. They just look like these metal, metal uh, uh, spikes. You can take a look at it. 
It's also the same fork that they used to stab Q's hand with. Yeah. Now you know why it hurts so much. But look at that. Yeah. It's like three syringes on a handle. <laughs> the point of negotiating was to take advantage. So uh, to take okay. advantage. Here we go. He's coming out. And they don't know what I'm off about. So we dance around each other. He would have made a really good um, Chrono work CEO. Yeah. I would like to have seen him come back on Deep Space Nine and go head to head with the Quark. Oh, yeah. like when they did that episode with the uh, the uh, the, uh, the guy from Guy and Species, yeah. I would, instead of having him, I would have had this guy show up on the station and then just really be able to manipulate everybody around Quark. Well, he was fired from his people as a negotiator at the end of the episode, though. Mm-hmm. Well, no, he's recalled. They never say he's fired because he's an independent contractor. Oh, okay. So here, here comes out the the uh, yeah. He, we're better than you story. So so he's revealed that he's part beta Z. That he has a little bit of this power, um, and that she feels he's wrong for hiding that, and that you should you should tell people if you're a beta Z instead of hiding. And his argument is, you know. I don't. I don't have it as good as you, and I need to fight every day for what I've got. Mm-hmm. And that I can't just tip people uh, my advantage; otherwise, I'll no longer have that advantage. Well, and it's not just that. He he says you do the same thing. How are you looking down on me? Mm-hmm. And he makes the point. He says when you go up there against the Romulans, do you the first thing that you say when you open nailing frequencies is, "Hi, I'm a telepath. You know, I'm an empath." Uh, over to you, Captain. No, well, she, it got around by word of mouth, though. Pretty much everybody that knows the Enterprise knows who she is and what her. Right, but when, is. but but you know, but but they still don't. I mean, that's why Picard keeps her on the bridge. And, and for Otherwise, that, I mean, she doesn't yeah. com- provide any other services on the bridge during shit. And for that hypocrisy is why he left that that dinner. Yeah, it's like you, you know, I'm no different than you. The only difference is I use this for. Private gain and, neg- and contract negotiations not serving in a military. Yeah, this capacity. is this is the smoothest Riker has ever been able to be with somebody that's challenging him. Yeah, I feel like this was sort of meant to even out their Bechtel death score from that with scene with Troy and Bev. Yeah. You know, Riker's never enjoyed being challenged. He always no. gets really uncomfortable and uppity. Like yeah. he enjoys being challenged by people who clearly aren't a threat, to right? Him. Yeah, and that he can easily just step up and be like, "That's right." But here, right. this guy, he kind of comes in and he takes his ex girlfriend, and he he's taking him at the, the negotiating table, which is all around lost to him. No, in, I, a, in a month, I'll have your command. <laughs> not only that, my drink tastes better than yours. <laughs> But at the same time, Riker clearly does say, hey, you know what? She's her own woman. She can do what she wants. But you can see he's he's kind of just saying that just so he can leave with a little bit of his dignity. Or Yeah. I well, mean, he, he's clearly been un- unnerved. He cares about her. Well, just like if someone, you know, was able... So I have a friend of mine who I, can, I love as much as a sister. It's not romantic, but I love her nonetheless. And so I get nervous when... You know, there is a new guy in her life. I'm like, oh, geez, you know, I, I hope everything goes out okay. I kind of wonder if the same thing's going down for Riker right now. Uh, oh. no, I think I think right at this point, he's actually thinking. He's actually reviewing, like, in his head, every decision he's made since they left parted company romantically. Oh, I bet. Just subconsciously. I bet. But he's also, but he also knows that this other guy is a slick salesman, so he's trying to do the whole, yeah, you think you got me, even though you didn't. I'm going to go back to my room now and blow on my trumpet, or my (laughs) side trombone. Well, we know from where Riker and Troy are now, and I'm, and I'm on board with this, and in, I'm reading the Peter David book, um, Rock at a Hard Place, that, Troy and Riker are exactly where both of them want to be at the moment because they have that mental connection. There's not, there really is not an if only going on between the two of them. Mm-hmm. I don't think a constant if only, but I think every once in a while, like for like a split second there when he mentioned that there was a, 
Yeah, I guess I could have gone that route. Not a, a lingering one, but just, you know. Oh, is, is this the uh, Ferengi might attack yeah. Ruse here? Yeah. And I don't see anything wrong with what the Ferengi are doing. I don't, well, see, I... Because they're not attacking this. the ship. So the Ferengi vessel... The Ferengi vessel moved. And, and they're asking why. Why did you move your ship out of or, orbit? The Ferengis are saying you've manipulated the negotiations. It's not been fair. You did not take us yeah. seriously. And Picard could have said, and it was like, well, you know, you know, if we had manipulated things from the very beginning, you weren't at the table at that point. We weren't required to, you know, brief you on what had happened before you showed up, before you stormed into negotiations. Oh, look at that. Wow, they wanted... They, what? Was that a laser beam we just saw? It was a phaser beam. Wow, a short blast. You don't normally see that. Again, they weren't very standardized of what they were doing yet, still. See, they're talking about missiles instead of torpedoes, still. Well, well that could be fir- what the Ferengi have, is missiles. Me, it takes a really long time for these guys to get back through the wormhole. This whole time, Data and Jordy had just been flying 8-bit style. Dip, dip. Dip, dip. Dip, dip. Then why did you even shoot at it? Because oh, they're trying the... to make a show of it. Ah. They're trying to provoke the Federation into going into red alert and battle stations being called. He knew that would pull Riker out of negotiations so he could have a minute to talk to the other person and say, look, this is what I've been telling you. Every five minutes, red alert this. Fire torpedoes at that. Didn't they say later oh, that she here's, can't... Yeah. Here's the big reveal. Deanna, in her job as a military counselor, said the opponent is lying. She turns to the negotiator telepath friend here, and she's about to reveal the whole thing as a fraud. Didn't she say later, later that she can't read Ferengi? Huh. You know, yeah, that was... They're not allowed to... Ferengi, they can't read Ferengi minds. And they've, they've, done, they've mentioned this at various points and then violated the rule at various no, points. No, no, but backwards from... Episode one to now to this point, they've yeah, never they have never that. They haven't said that. Yeah, the the I whole think Fer- they have the whole Ferengi yeah. telepathy thing was Alexana Troy. Someone stole my necklace thing. No, 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 no. They mentioned it uh, in in Menage a Trois, uh, Troy episode in the Next Generation where she says well, she can't. Really yeah, we haven't gotten Menage the future, Troy, but I believe they yeah. mentioned it also at the one where they're at that the last outpost. Huh. Okay. Well, we'll have to go back and check the archives. So yeah, if I could record a whole there. episode again, it would be uh, actually two episodes I'd want to do again, where no one has gone before in Last Outpost. Oh yeah, because I watched both because I had not watched the episode before we recorded those. No. So. It's a little bit of posturing on the bridge there. They've dismantled the uh, logistical threat of the Ferengi. It wasn't tense at all. In fact, I felt more tension from you all I was tense. <laughs> I was ready to blow. These people, I tell you. Yeah. The Federation very much talks down to subspecies. Like yeah. the people they see as subspecies. Yeah, I, my mistake. I apologize. But they, they take a very imperial view of all oh, these savages. Yeah. And yes, it did put me in a conflict of interest, which I hope I have now I believe Raul has used your fear of continuing aggression between the Federation and its enemies. Yep. Alright, so she's saying that this guy is playing upon everybody's military fears to continue the negotiations. And the Crusalians are the uh, are the peace loving group, if I remember correctly. They're the more science. They're like the they 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 claim they want they want to, are only interested in pure research, right? Not it, mundane tasks and combat. Exactly, and 
you either you either have the profit motive from the Ferengi or the military motive from the Federation. The Delta Quadrant. So, Data, he explains that the wormhole is stable on this end, but it flops around like a wet noodle on the other side. And it could be here, it could be there. See, I don't agree with Jordy there. That's not a dry well. If you know it's stable on this point, even if it's only for a few years, you can still just send massive probes oh, into yeah. random parts oh, of the yeah. galaxy and get tons of data. Okay, that is worth a lot still. I give the scout ship as tribute. <laughs> I wonder how many people are willing to go for that, though, because you don't know when it's going to... Right. You could have adventure colonists or just random probes. I mean, it's just... Yeah. Don't, don't I, I would have had to have been something where um, they were able to tell where they were to some kind of, some kind of uh, stabilization uh, beacon. Because that is, I mean, they're not explored space. He knows exactly where they are. So I'm looking at Troy's outfit here. Does does it seem to sag on one side of her chest? Yeah, because of the uh, communicator badge. Yeah. Well, like, I think it's the way her... It's yeah, the look, way it's, it's, the way it's, it's the way it's cut. It's okay. cut differently. Okay, I was just like, what the heck? It's kind of a sarong kind of a thing. Yeah, I never noticed that before. She would look great in a wrap. Like a wrap uniform? Uh-huh. Like, um... Like Flav of Flav with the clock and everything. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Jeez. Or like Captain Kirk's green uniform. Yeah. I, I was thinking I was thinking more like India, but Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that kind of wrap. Like a wrap of like a, a fitted sheet yeah. that's also clothing. Well not a fitted sheet, but a, a tailored piece of cloth that is a wrap as clothing. So, so, in the end, yeah, the special effects in the HD are not that different than the ones on the SD. Okay, it's, it's about 50-50. I like that 8-bit smear that they did with the shuttles. <laughs> that was kind of neat. So, he's trying to get a little bit of dignity out of this. I think he's trying to ask Deanna to go with him when he leaves. Is that, is that your yeah, read on this? Yeah, just like the woman that you saw him with at the very beginning that he threw away. Yeah, what happened to her? He said he sent her home. Oh. She right. asked about it right away. It's like she's like, You were here with somebody. He's like, Oh yeah, I sent her home. He told her to get something out of the <laughs> airlock that pressed the button. Well, already that circumstance uh circ subset uh subset I can't talk. That is suspect. Oh, I just threw people away. She looks hurt. Yep. You know, this was just supposed to be a fun weekend in port, and she didn't mean to fall in love with somebody. I think she did, but it wasn't going to work out. So, how many Ferengi missiles do we each want to give this? Ferengi missiles? Oh, jeez. I'm going to fire off, uh, I want to give it a good solid four. Yeah, I can see that. The only thing of value, well, before I get into it, why do you give it a format? What's what's your measure? I, I, I like I like so you get to see the Ferengi finally doing the whole we're not space pirates, we're businessmen, we're just not very scrupulous businessmen. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to see Ferengi who aren't the same Ferengi actors every time. Yeah. So we get a little bit different take on them. Mm -hmm. I like anytime Deanna Troy gets put in her morally superior place. Is, is a good thing for me. And it's just, I, I thought it was a decent episode. I mean, I, I mean I, the special effects, I'd give a rat's ass on that. That was not a big deal for me. Um, but the story was actually a good story, and they, they showed with it, and they make a good point. The Federation, as peace-loving as they claim, are always getting into crap. Mm -hmm. there, it's, it, it's a good thing. It's just like, you're, you know, there's, there, not a time goes by that there isn't a, we got to raise shields, and there's a lot of people who have conflict with the Federation. So it's one of those, yeah, you, you might, you know, the Federation might be big and have a lot of resources, but they got a lot of baggage that comes with it. And they they actually proved themselves right when they got into that little pissing contest. Yeah, it was as that easy to provoke them, you know, and it's one of those, are you looking for, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, if you, it would be one thing if the Crusade, you know, if the, uh, the Barzans were looking for a strong defense, like, hey, we're always getting raided by, you know, by Nausicans or something, and we're always getting... Attacked, we need a strong military, but they're one of those. We, we just need someone who can give us shit. Yeah. Okay, cool. I buy that. Yeah, David, how many? Yeah, five or six. Okay. 
five or six? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Typically do it out of five. That's all right. So you gave it 110%. Why is that? You know, the negotiations were kind of interesting. And, you know, just the moment when the Ferengi realized the wormhole just moved is awesome. Yes. Yeah, that look on their face like, oh. Yeah, no, those are two really good actors, too. All right, cool. And uh, Pat? I give, it a th- I give it a three. It established the Ferengi. It showed... You know, what Troy does and what people think of Troy. Mm-hmm. Um, it had some good Riker moments where it's not him being an ass to somebody else. Right. It's not him you know, putting his foot on somebody's chest. So, yeah. Uh, and again, we get to see those Ferengi again on uh, Voyager in a few years. So, I, I, I look at the episode now and it just puts me to sleep. It put me to sleep, too, when I was a kid. Um, but when you look at the story development, it's a very valuable episode. It kind of identifies just how mature Riker can be. And he's comfortable. And a comfortable Riker is something we don't normally see, right? And, uh, you know, Deanna, she's starting to explore her own feelings and emotions, which is great. I kind of don't like the idea how they, they painted Raul into the bad guy, because he really did nothing wrong. The Ferengi really did nothing wrong with the exception of firing that missile at the end, like what you were saying there, Matt. But uh, you're right. It, I think that we're starting to kind of set up a lot of long-term arcs here, the pretentiousness of the Federation and, you know, how Riker and Deanna relate to each other. And we're seeing yet another reestablishment. I wouldn't call it a reboot of the Ferengi, but it, it kind of helps move them towards the we're not going to blow you up, we're just businessmen uh, kind of thing. So it's, it's all right. So out of all that, I would give it probably about a three out of five. Thank you very much for listening to another great episode of Next Generation's First Generation. Uh, what do we have coming up next? The Vengeance Factor. Ooh, very cool. Uh, Also, make sure to look back at some of the other episodes we have in our catalog. Yes, we have a catalog now. Can you believe it? Check it out on iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you can listen to your favorite podcasts. If you want to contact the show, our email address is... NextGenFirstGenPod at gmail.com And with that, we'd like to say, have a wonderful day. So you're the guest. So Sasha, what is Star Trek? Hi, I'm the guest. So Sasha, what is Star Trek? (laughs) Seek us out at Next Generation's First Generation at iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Music credits include... Electric Car by Poddington Bear Broke for Free As Colorful as Ever About Last Night by Audio Binger Soulful Vision by Necrotage Audio Engineering by Sasha Shouties Chief Meme Maker and Episode Cover Credit goes to Matthew Kirshner Logo and Graphic Art Design Credit goes to David Clawwitter And special thanks to Patrick Delmore for working with other podcasts to make sure the good work gets out. Do you have a podcast that you think people should be listening to? Send us your promos and we'll play them on the show. If you'd like to email the show, you can email us at nextgenfirstgenpod at gmail.com. I've been Patrick Delmore. And this is Sasha Shouties. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Good night.